in one minute. Thanks so much for worshiping with us. Here's what's happening this week at Eastwood Tulsa. Happy birthday, Eastwood. Celebrate with us today by enjoying some birthday cake and coffee in the foyer right after service. Faith Week 2021 is happening now. Please take time this week to pray for our students and sponsors. Eastwood's Mission Week is July 5th through the 9th. Along with the team from First Baptist Moreland, Oklahoma and Mobile Missions from Sepulpa, we will be reaching out to a local mobile home park and apartment complex for a week of ministry and evangelism. Please pray about how you can be involved. Mexico Mission 2021 begins July 5th and there are still spots available. See Gordon Small for more information. Senior Adult Ministry Luncheon resumes July 8th at 11 a.m. in the Family Life Center. Come and enjoy lunch and patriotic music from Phil Blunt. Pit Crews Needed. We need volunteers that can help coach third through fifth graders in building, painting, and racing Pinewood Derby racers during Lindbergh Elementary School's summer camp. Project begins July 13th. Sign up on the digital guide. Help us welcome international students to the University of Tulsa by donating used furniture to Furniture Fest 2021. Schedule your pickup at icotulsa.org. Gifts are tax deductible. Once again, we welcome you to Eastwood Tulsa. Now please join in with the team as they lead us in worship. Let's stand together as we begin to worship God today. We're so glad that you're with us. Let's worship him today. Mm -hmm. Oh, we've gathered in your name. We've gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. Oh, and you're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, feeling every part of our prayer. in this place your glory on our face we're looking to the sky descending like a cloud you're standing with us now lord unveil our eyes oh and you're the reason we're here you're the reason we're singing open up the heavens we want to see up the blood gates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, feeling every part of our praise. Open up, oh, and open up the heavens. We want to see you open up the blood gates, a mighty river flowing from your heart. Show us your glory, 
Show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Let's say that together. Show us this morning. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Let's sing it one more time. Show us, oh, show us, and show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. praise. We're so glad that you guys are with us. Here we go. One. There we go. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but what? Have everlasting life. Amen. And come all ye weary and come all ye thirsty Come to the well that never runs dry. Oh, drink of the water and come and thirst no more. Oh, and come all ye sinners and come find his mercy. Come to the table he will satisfy. Oh, taste of his goodness. Find what you're looking for. For God so loved. Oh, for God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Oh, and bring all your failures and bring your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross, because Jesus is waiting there. With open arms Oh, for God so loved The world that he gave us His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in him Will live forever Oh, the power of hell Forever defeated Now it is well I'm walking in freedom for God so loved, God so loved the world. And praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Amen. Let's praise Him. Praise God. And praise God, oh, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love, His amazing love. For God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save us. For God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever oh the power of hell forever defeated now it is well i'm walking in freedom for god so loved god so loved the world So loved, God so loved the world. Amen, amen.
amen. Lord, we thank you that you loved us so much that while we were yet in sin, Christ died for us. Lord, we can rally around the cross and what Jesus did for us, a finished work that completely sets us free. It is the power of God and the salvation. Lord, we praise you today and we thank you. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. We are very glad that you are with us today. Obviously, today, all of our students and other adults, they're at Faith Week, and, uh, and there's lots happening there. We did get there yesterday uh, amongst all kinds of uh, uh, adversity. That would be a better uh, way to say it. And so uh, I want to read you this morning. Um, Zach uh, sent me a text message uh, to read to you guys, um, and he says, he says, we made it to Faith Week. Uh, God is moving, and students are starting to open up and talking about issues in their life. Praise the Lord. Uh, questions are being asked. Conversations are happening. And this is awesome. Hearts are getting raw. In other words, they're getting real. Amen. Uh, they had an awesome breakout session this morning. You want to say thank you, Eastwood, for sending students to Faith Week, for everything that you guys have, get, for, have given to help that. Please continue to pray for our students and our workers as we are there the rest of this week. They'll be all coming back on Wednesday. And I specifically ask you to pray. Um, I mean, God is dealing with hearts, but there is a lot of lost that are at this camp, Okay. And so let's just, can we take just a second right now and just pray over them? They're in their morning worship session right now. And let's just pray and agree uh, as that God is moving his spirit and he can deal with hearts and that we're going to see many come to Christ during this. Father, Lord, we call out to you. Lord, and in that campground and Camp Wow right now, Father, that your spirit is at work. Lord, that you are touching lives, every single one of them, whether they've been in church forever or like some, even a couple we took this week. Wednesday night was their first time they ever came to church. So Lord, I pray that you would make yourself real and known. Father, that there would be salvation this week. That through the convicting power of your spirit, Lord, you will bring them to, you, to yourself. And, Lord, we're going to hear the report of salvation, lives changed, Lord, and those that you are calling into missions and ministry and setting their feet on the right path to what you have for them. So, Lord, we pray for our leaders, for Zach and everyone else, all the rest of the staff and the other churches and their leadership, Father, that they will be godly examples and speak the word of God boldly. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. Well, we welcome the rest of you. If this is your first time with us, we appreciate you being here on this Sunday morning in June. And it was a very rainy one this morning. So did you wake up to the thunder and all the wind and stuff? It's pretty, pretty exciting. Um, I actually had to probably take boat uh, to get here. So I left early this morning from the camp. So I'm glad to be here with you guys. If this is your first time, we really welcome you uh, to this. And we're going to have a little celebration today. So we're, have, we're celebrating our 65th birthday as a church. So we're really glad that you're with us. And after this service is over, we invite you to share some cake with us, okay, as we go out. And we're just going to fellowship and just celebrate the, the faithfulness of God for 65 years from one corner that the gospel and the, and the light of Jesus is being proclaimed. Isn't that awesome? So guests, thanks for being with it. We, if it's your first time, there's a welcome card in front of you. Fill that out. If you're on our digital guide, you can do that on the online connect card. We'd love to get to know you. We have a gift for you after service, so we'll meet you out in the lobby. In just one more week, after this next week is our missions week. So our mission team, uh, Brother Gordon is leading a team to Mexico. So they're going to be leaving on the 5th of July, headed back to Mexico to do a work. But on the 4th of July, which is a big Independence Day, everybody will be shooting off fireworks, we're going to be receiving a group from Moreland, Oklahoma. And then that week from the 5th through the 9th, we're going to be doing missions and outreach right here in our neighborhood. And so it's going to be an awesome time of reaching out to Mobile Home Park next to us and then an apartment complex. And so I ask you to pray over that week um, that we will see many come to Christ just right here. All of them we're going to be connecting with as a church between us 
and our, uh, our brothers and sisters at Agape, and just we're, wanting, we're, we're expecting to see people reach for the gospel and some lives change. So pray over that uh, that's coming up. We got a lot that's happening the month of July. It's going to be a good month, so you want to stick around, stay informed, right, Brother Tom? It's going to be a good month. You do not want to miss a week, and I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm giving you hints. This is called previews for coming attractions. They do this at movies. Okay, you don't want to miss a week of July, okay? So if you had vacation, shame on you, okay? But uh, no, it's going to be a really, really powerful month this month, and I believe God has got a lot for us. So we're really glad you're with us. As we turn our focus for just a second on giving, we just talked about how God so loved us that he gave. And so this morning, as we just take a moment here to focus ourselves as we as we think about our own giving to the Lord, the command that God has given us is that we should share, that we should give. He gave it all. We're not asking you to give it all today, but when it comes to our heart, he does ask us to give it all. Amen? Isn't that true? So today, take a moment and just ask the Lord, Lord, what do you have me give? Maybe you already purposed in your heart. You have your tithe, your offering, and you're ready to do that. Okay? Maybe you didn't. Well, then take a moment. There's all the ways to give that you see online uh, that is there. There's also offering envelopes in there. And at the end of the service, when we leave to go have birthday cake, uh, our ushers will be there, and you can drop uh, your offering there in the bucket there at the doors as you go out. But let's just take a moment and prepare our hearts to give in that way, okay? Lord, you gave all for us. Your command was that we would give back to you and be obedient to your word. Lord, this morning I pray for each one of us, no matter how you're dealing with us, maybe we've already purposed in our heart, or Lord, you're going to speak something to us that we need to be obedient in uh, during this service. Lord, it's not about the money, it's about our heart. And so Lord, I thank you today that we will be obedient to all that you have asked us to do. So Lord, we give this to you as, a, as an offering, that is an act of worship because we love you. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'll ask you to stand on your feet again as we continue to worship the Lord.
praise. Yes, yes, Lord. The powerful name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. It's at the name of Jesus that demons flee. That name that he has given us. That we can pray, we can ask the Father. It's Jesus. Jesus. Lord, we worship you today. Thank you.
Father, as we uh, come before you today in prayer, that's exactly the cry of our heart. We need you, Lord. Father, it seems that every day's events drive us deeper into your arms. We see immediately the world does not have the answer, Father. Only you have the answer. And so, Father, in the next few moments, we open our hearts to you. We pray to you. We are so glad that you are present in this place. And, uh, Lord, we're also so happy that our students are hearing from you as they meet at Faith Week. We pray for them. We pray for our counselors, our workers, everyone involved in the camp, Lord. We, we ask that you, would, uh, that you would speak to each heart, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated, please. And uh, Jeremy, when you come back from camp, we want you to bring your voice back with you, all right? I talked to him earlier this week, and, uh, you know, he's been battling this thing for a little bit, and I thought, he's going to go to camp. I know when I went to Faith Week, I would always come back without my voice, much to my family's delight. And um, so we want you back with your voice, Jeremy, Where when you come back. I'm glad to see you here this morning. It's obvious that we've got a lot of kids who are at camp, and uh, I, I you know, 48 years, this is the 48th year of Faith Week, and Faith Week is synonymous with our church, with Eastwood. Uh, and you recall that over the year, literally thousands of students and their workers have had their lives changed by the Lord God as they met with Him at Faith Week. Whatever the setting, and there's been two or three different settings, as you know, over the 48 years of that camp's history. So do not let a day go by that you don't pray for the workers and pray for the, for the students. And we eagerly look forward to their return and hearing what it is that God has spoken to their hearts during this important time in their life. Guests, we are delighted that you're here. We thank you for being here. We pray that you will feel welcomed. Today, we celebrate the 65th birthday, as you have already heard, cake, and the celebration will be out in the, uh, in the uh, uh, meeting area out here just uh, after the worship service this morning, and what do you call it, a foyer or a vestibule or a hallway or whatever that is behind you, and uh, we'll, have a, we'll have a good time reminiscing while we're out there. It's not just the 65 years that God has brought this church. It's the, it's the years, the days ahead that God has for this church, I think, which are uh, of critical importance. I have a friend who uh, comes up with really good sayings all the time. And uh, I asked him, he pastors a church, and the church uh, literally was in a sort of a of a backwater town down in South Georgia, and, and many, many people sort of wrote the church off. It, it, and when he went there as pastor, they said, you know, you're going to that town. That's not all that big a place. You, you ought to be someplace else. And his statement was always this, God didn't do a bad thing out of Bethlehem. Of course, now you've seen the movies Fireproof and Facing the Giants and Courageous, and uh, th those are movies which come, among other things, from that church, and they have touched the world from their Bethlehem. And the reason I think God really loves doing that is because that's more what churches are than than what we see sometimes of the city set on a hill, you know, that's the church. We say, well, now they'll have influence. No. It's churches like this church right here that touch the world with the gospel. They have their role, but this is where most churches are, and it gives them incredible hope when they see God at work in a church like Eastwood that blesses them, and they say, hey, take heart, take, take courage, because God 
If he can do it there in that Bethlehem, he can do it in my church and he can do it in my life. Over the next several weeks, and I wish I could tell you how many weeks, but I, I don't think the Lord has even told me yet um, how, how long this particular series will last. So, so many unknowns, of course. But over the next few weeks at least, we're going to be focusing our attention on revival. Not so much corporate revival, although you would agree with me that the only hope for our nation is revival. Actually, actually, the only hope for our nation is not revival. Revival is what happens when God's people get revived. Uh, they begin to, to realize that the Christ who lives within them wants to live his life through them. What we need in our nation is a spiritual awakening. Uh, we are, someone has said that we are, perhaps we're a post-Christian nation. That is, we're a nation that used to uh, have its uh, foundations in the Lord and then sort of lost their bearings. Now we're sort of basking in the afterglow of that. I'm not so sure we are not a pre-Christian nation, that we are so far away from our roots that we might consider ourselves as being pre-Christian. It's so hard, it's so hard now for us to find that kind of influence where it ought to be. And we've got faithful people in different branches of government, different businesses and different communities. But you see it, don't you? The need for our nation is a spiritual awakening. So, so what is your part? What is my part? Well, it is personal revival. And so I'm going to be asking you, and, and Diana and I have talked about this. I mean, this is for us as well, all, all of us. Uh, I, I would like for us to go on a journey, a discussion about what that looks like. What would it mean for you and for me to experience revival? Now, if enough of us are experiencing revival and living in revival, then yes, we might see corporate revival. And I'll tell you, if that happens, when God sets himself down in the midst of a church family, wherever it is that is experiencing revival, it will not be anything cosmetic. You don't have to figure out ways and emphases and things like that to, to get people to come. God is his own greatest attraction. And when he shows up, he will draw people to this church. So what's your role? What's my role? You need to experience, I need to experience, I think, personal revival, personal revival. So you can just draw a circle around yourself as we study the scriptures from week to week for the next several weeks and say, okay, Lord, how, what is the action point for me? What, what is it uh, that should be my response? And I can tell you one thing that it should not merely be, and I say this because this is where most people light. It is not merely endorsing the truth that we need revival or that you need revival. It's not saying, amen, brother. Well, that's good. We need revival. The world's going to hell in a handbasket. We've got to have, we've got to have, no, it's not, that's a fact. Your part, my part involves personal, spiritual examination and surrender. And so we're going to be looking at that over the next several weeks. This morning, I would like for you to think about uh, a very interesting verse in the 10th chapter of Hosea. So would you turn with me to the book of Hosea? And we're going to be thinking about revival, revival in your heart, your home. Uh, we're going to be thinking about breaking up the fallow ground of your heart. Now, what in the world does that mean? Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. You have your Bible there open. And so let's look at this interesting verse. Before, we, before I read it, let me just say a word about Hosea. You sort of recognize his name is in some other Bible names like Joshua 
or even Jesus. It, it is a name that means salvation. Hosea was a prophet of God in the northern kingdom. Israel was a term often used for the northern kingdom, while down south it would have been called Judah. Israel, the ten tribes for the most part to the north, at this time, and Judah wasn't far behind, was in total spiritual disrepair. The truth of the matter is there is not anything that is being practiced in this nation right now that was not being practiced among people who call themselves God's people in the day when Hosea was written. Right down to the killing of children. It was all the godless worship of of idols. I mean, I mean, they as bad as we are, they were equally so, maybe sometimes more so. Hosea prophesied eight centuries before Jesus showed up on the scene. By the way, he's an interesting, he's an interesting guy because most prophets didn't live long enough to see their prophecies come true. Hosea did. He is the, when, you, when you're reading in the Old Testament, he's the first of what we call the minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, and so forth. And they're not minor because they're less important. They're just minor, we're called minor prophets because uh, what they wrote comprises a smaller portion of Scripture than what we call the major prophets like, like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and so forth. And so there are 12 minor prophets prophets, smaller uh, writings of, of prophets. And Hosea is the first of these 12 in your scripture, in the order of the scripture. Uh, he had some contemporaries down south in, in uh, uh, Judah at this time. If you had gone down there, you, would have, you, you could have met uh, some, some contemporaries of his, like, like Isaiah or uh, uh, as he as he prophesied down there, Hosea in the north uh, would have had prophets like uh, uh, Amos and Jonah were his contemporaries to the to the to the north. And so here we've got uh, Isaiah and and Micah, by the way, down in in Judah. Here's Hosea up in the north prophesying to a godless nation. They call themselves God's people. The people with whom God has made an eternal covenant, and yet they cannot violate the principles of God without consequence, and, and Hosea is a prophet. Now, let me remind you this, that the test of a prophet is that everything he prophesies comes true. If it doesn't, he dies. Sometimes prophets die just because of their prophecy, but, but what Hosea prophesied, everything came true, most of it in his own lifetime. And of course, after, after his prophecies came true, then Israel had been carried away and disappeared and uh, for the longest time scattered uh, throughout, throughout the earth. And so look with me at this prophecy. Hosea is appealing from his heart. Verse 12 sort of captures his message. He says, sow with a view to righteousness, reap in accordance with kindness. And then here's what I'd like for us to think about this morning. Break up your fallow ground for it's time to seek the Lord until he comes to rain righteousness upon you. Break up your fallow ground. And so this morning, I'd like for you to think with me about what that means. What would it mean for you to go home from this service today and to enter in on a personal exercise? I don't care how long you've been a member of this church. I don't care. It has nothing to do with what age you are or stage you are in life. It has nothing to do with what you have done in the past. It has everything to do with what you intend to be and to do with the balance of your life. The opportunity God is presenting you, us, to experience revival, personal and possibly corporate revival. 
Would that not be an amazing and needful thing in this generation that God would raise up a picture of what happens when people's hearts are totally surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Breaking up your fallow ground. Now, I asked Diana a couple times this last week if she wouldn't like to go with me up to Aline, you know where that is, which is out, it's, it's, it's about two and a half hours from here up on the, toward the Kansas border. It is west of Enid. Uh, it's out there in the middle of no man's land. Why in the world would you want to go there? Well, there is a museum it's a uh, it's sort of a pioneer museum and that museum is built around it sort of encompasses the last as far as we know the last prairie sod cabin that was built in Oklahoma in 1894 uh, by the McCulley family and it's it's a very interesting museum i i understand we never got there and uh, i said still on my on my to-do list now, I do, I do know some things about it, though, and that is that they call it the Prairie Sod Cabin because back in the days when Oklahoma was being settled, people looked out on this verdant prairie. You know the dividing line of Oklahoma. We've got uh, Meridian Road that runs north to south, uh, Indian Meridian Road in Oklahoma City, which is ostensibly the middle, the dividing point of Oklahoma. And you remember, of course, the land run. There were several land runs. But, but they, man, I tell you, uh, they thought this is instant farm. And they got out there, and when they tried to plow the land, they couldn't. It was as hard as the floor that you got your feet on right now. Because, see, it had lain fallow since creation. And the, the, the plants that had been on were matted over it, and it was, it was hard. And they, they had, in fact, they've got some implements here. I've looked sort of through their, looked through their uh, uh, agenda that they have. But they finally came up with, with a sledge that you put down under the soil, and it was pulled by eight oxen, four teams of ox, for eight oxen. That's what it took to get through the soil. So in the meantime, they were smart enough to take an axe and they could cut up this fallow ground and they could make blocks out of it like brick and they could build a sod hut. It's incredible thermal qualities. I mean, you're not going to run home and build you one, but, but it has great thermal qualities. It's tough because it's just as, as hard as rock. That is a picture of fallow ground. So I want to make three observations, and then we're going to come to the invitation. And I want to make the invitation real clear. So I'm, I will repeat it. I'll, I'll, I'll share it with you right now, and then I'll say it again at the close of the service. I'm going to ask you to join me, join us here and others at the altar, or whatever, however you feel comfortable, as close as you can get to the altar and we're going to, at the close of the service, I'm going to ask every person in this room who will say, I don't know all that Brother Tom was talking about and all that that scripture means, but I did pick up some things about how to start breaking up the fallow ground of my heart, and this week, by God's grace, I'm going to start doing that. This week, my response will be that I will take some steps to break up the fallow ground of my heart. Now, whatever your age, as I said, or stage in life, and we'll just, we'll gather here or around here or up the aisles, however you feel comfortable, and we're going to pray, God, hold my feet to the fire. I want to break up the fallow ground of my heart. Why is that important? If you don't, you won't have personal revival. It's just that simple. If you're unwilling to do that, then do not expect God to bring revival to your heart. You don't have some special in with him that allows you to run around and, and not obey the principles of revival, but get the results. It's not going to happen that way. It requires us, you, me, breaking up 
the fallow ground of our heart, okay? So let me make three uh, brief observations, and then we'll come to the time of invitation in these next few moments. First of all, in this verse, there is what I want to call a condition to be feared. A condition to be feared. Now, and, and, I, and you'll understand why you ought to fear it. And I'm speaking to Christians. Those of you, those of us here who say, I know and I know that if I died, I'd go to heaven. Jesus Christ is my Savior. He's in my heart. What is this condition that ought to, ought to scare you? You ought to say, I do not want to get there. It, it, and you'll see why in a minute. It is that your heart would become like fallow ground. Incredible potential, but unable, unable to be moved. Now, now, what would be some qualities of your life? How would you spot that if your heart was becoming like fallow ground? Well, let me mention seven. Just, just briefly. The first is this, that you would be hard-hearted. And some, I can hear some of you all saying inside, well, I'm not a hard-hearted person. So that, well, here's what I mean by that. Are you ready? You can come to a service like this and have the surface of your spiritual life scratched emotionally just a little bit by the right song or the right sermon, and go home unchanged. Nothing has changed. In other words, if you go home today and say, well, I'm not going to break up the right that there you are. That's it. Just to come and be, be stirred a little bit emotionally. Be glad that I saw my friends. I was in church. That was great. But no change from week to week, not growing in the knowledge and in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. No change. Nobody says of you anymore, you know, I, you're, you're really growing in the grace of the Lord. You're, you're becoming more Christ-like. Day by day, I just see changes in your life. How long has it been since somebody has said that to you? And some of you I'll be honest with you, I, 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 in all kinds of churches, people just sit there and they don't grow and they are not, they get harder because more truth pounds on them and just seems like it compresses, but they don't change. So you become hard. I love you. I, and, and I'm telling you this because I, this is not easy for me. Secondly, you'll become impervious to the Word of God. Fallow ground is like that. If you, if you went, it's hard to find it, it anymore in Oklahoma, but if, if you went in those days when you could, uh, the seed that blows through the wind or come brought by birds or whatever, they, uh, do not penetrate because it has this heavy, back in those days, blue stem, a heavy mat over the top of it. And so it becomes impervious to the Word. I mean, it's just like the Bible bounces off of you. you read, that's an interesting verse. Oh, that's a good sermon, preacher. But it just bounces off of you. It doesn't, make any, it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't go down in your heart and begin working in your life and my life and, and producing fruit because the Word of God is what? Alive, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, cutting to the dividing asunder of, soul, of, of, of joint and marrow, soul and spirit. So to hear the Word in a Sunday school class or in church over and over and over and over again just bounces off, impervious to the Word. Number three, fallow ground it has as a, its characteristic, characteristic, stubbornness. Stubbornness. Anybody ever say to you, now, I got a great idea. Before you say no, what they're doing is they're saying, you know, you your character is, I know you just automatically say no to everything. Before you say no. But fallow ground is noted for its stubbornness and its resistance to change. How, how th does that ha have any, in any way describe you? 
that you're, you're stubborn and resistant to change? I don't know. All right, number four, fallow ground is unfruitful. That's what it is. It's fallow ground. It has incredible potential. All the minerals locked up in it over the centuries. Incredible potential, but it's unfruitful. Back in the uh, mid-1600s, there was a a preacher, you know his name. His name was John Bunyan. He wrote Pilgrim's Progress, among other things. Spent time in prison, as a matter of fact. Listen to what he said one day. He said, God, keep me back from being like a, a painted fire that gives no warmth. Or a painted flower that has no fragrance. Or a painted tree that bears no fruit. You got the picture, don't you? It looks like everything is right. Everything is in place. I got my Bible in my hand. In my pew. I'm here. The question is, are you bearing fruit? Does there, does there just emanate from you the fruit of the Spirit, love? Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, goodness, temperance. Here is a sixth quality of a, fallow, a heart that's like fallow ground, and that is it's asleep during the season, spiritual seasons. Fallow ground is just fallow ground. Summer, winter, spring, fall, fallow ground. Sometimes it's got snow on it, sometimes it's got it's got hot sun blazing on it, but it's just, it's just fallow ground. Do you know anybody like that that just asleep? I mean, the Lord can come and move and move in his, and, 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 and touch other people's lives. People get saved and folks get baptized and their lives change, but just, just asleep during the seasons, insensitive to what God could be doing. Let me mention a last one here. This is sort of scary. Well, this is number six. That was number five. Number six is it will require great effort to change. I already mentioned that fallow ground, physical fallow ground, they couldn't change it apart from eight oxen and a sledge. And, and, and I know, I, what, what is it going to take for God to get your attention? What effort would God have to go to to bring change in your life, to get down below the surface and to stir things up in your heart? What would God have to do? I hate to even think about what it might be for some of us, for God to get our attention. And here's the seventh one. Fallow ground is to the believer, a heart like fallow ground, to the believer what a reprobate heart is to an unbeliever. A reprobate heart, an unbeliever has a reprobate heart who said no and I don't, I'm never going to say yes, is one step away from the judgment of God. So is a person whose heart is like fallow ground, a believer in Christ, just one step away from the judgment of God. God doesn't have to just keep banging on the door of your heart or mine and saying, I I." I I need you. I want you. I want to utilize you. I want you to see this. So you understand what I'm saying? This is why this is a condition we ought to fear like crazy. That our hearts have become like fallow ground. Now, two more observations and then invitation. The next observation is this. There is in this verse, and you saw it, there's a command to be followed. You see it here? Sow with a view to righteousness. Reap in accordance with kindness. Break up your fallow ground. So that's a command. So, so what, what does that mean for you and me? Why would I even want to think about making a decision this morning, responding to the invitation? Because it is an invitation for God to...
to join you as you begin the process of breaking up the fallow ground of your heart. Let him kick the board over, so to speak. I, I use that sometimes, and people say, what in the world does that mean? When I was a kid, everybody ought to grow up on or near a farm, right? I mean, because it teaches that some things are not optional. You don't get up in the morning and say, I don't think I want to milk. You don't get to vote on that. You do. Uh, so so we would, when we go fishing, we needed worms. So what we do? We go out and find a board that had been on the ground so long that grass had begun to grow through it. And you kick it over, and immediately there's all these creepy crawlies, and they, of course, begin to burrow down under the ground. And your job is to get the spade under them before they get under the spade, because that's, your, that's your, what you're going to use for bait for fishing. Well, we've all got those creepy crawlies under the board. They're in our heart. We bring them into the worship service. We bring them to the dinner table. We sit with a bag of them as we watch TV at night. These creepy, these, these sins in our life. And you just, what it means is that you just begin saying, Lord, I want to I wanna clear the deck. Lord, I want to I come to you in confession. What about sins of omission, things that you ought to do that you don't do? I, if I were, if I were a betting man, which I'm not, but if I were, I would bet and win this bet that there's some of us seated here this morning in this service who have never been scripturally baptized. Oh yes, you got wet at one time, but it wasn't telling the truth that you are saved because later on you came to know Christ as your Savior and you just said, well, it's no big deal. You don't go to heaven and be baptized. I'm not, and, and it hurts your pride. And so there it is. You just bring it to church every morning, every Sunday morning. This refusal to follow the Lord's command to be baptized. Perhaps you don't have a devotional life or Maybe there's no obedience of faith in your life, no, no love. Perhaps you're not witnessing to other people. What about, what, what about uh, sacrificial service, service that really costs you something? What about scriptural stewardship? What a, do you have a family altar? I mean, people sitting next to you know the truth about that, that don't they? So you begin with, these are things that, that I'm leaving out of my life that God wants to be a part of my life. God, I'm going to confess every one of them. What about sins of commission, things you do that you shouldn't do? Slander and gossip, wishing ill on other people. I mean, I, Christians have, have now fallen into this camp that because we don't like some things that, that some people do that control our lives, we wish ill on them, wishing ill on other, other people, secret sins, evil habits, selfishness, critical spirit, working for God without worshiping God, choosing the world over God. I don't know what they are, but, but here, here's, here's what I want us to see. If you and I are unwilling to say, okay, God, I, I see it. I have a heart that is like fallow ground. I want you to break up my heart. And I want you to stay with me, Lord, and, 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 and guide me as I do this. But, but if you refuse to do that, and this is the reason I come this, this morning with a burden if you refuse, if this church refuses, if you refuse, your greatest days of usefulness to God are over. Done. If you refuse to break up the fallow ground of your heart, this church's greatest days of usefulness to God are over. You don't think God's going to say, well, you have a heart that's like fallow ground and there's some things that you need to deal with. Well, I'm not going to deal with them. Okay, well, I'll use you in a great way anyway. No, it's not going to happen. 
okay, well, I'll bless your family anyway. No, no, it's not going to happen. Anytime we put our foot down and plant our heart and say, I'm, I'm what I need to be now. God bless me and you. God says, sorry, I can't. So all, listen, and wouldn't this be a terrible thing for this church? All you can do is press forward to the past. It'd just be all you have is the memory of the past, not what God can do in the future. Just what he did one time in the past. Oh, we don't want to get stuck there, do we? So that, that brings me, and I, I'm, I hope you hear, I'm, I'm preaching out of love. I think I know you, maybe I don't. I hope, hope you hear what I'm trying to say. So that brings me to this last observation, and that is that there is a, there's a, a choice to be faced. It's time, he says. It is time to seek the Lord until he comes to rain righteousness upon you. So, so what is the choice? All right. Uh, number one, you can just continue doing nothing. You continue resisting, only becoming more resistant. I remind you that, that Proverbs 29, 1 ought to make a cold chill run down your back because it says, He who being often reproved hardens his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. Broken beyond remedy. No repair. I hope you hear what, what the Word of God is saying. Because see, what, my tendency... You know this. You know this about Brother Tom. My tendency is to want everybody to love her body and be happy and just do the right thing and let God bless us. And we love being up there because everybody knows that I just love this and love it. That's the tendency. But let me just tell you something, folks. God, what God's tendency is to get glory through his people. And if we say, okay, Lord, I'm drawing a line here. This far, no farther. I've done all I'm going to do. That was then. This is now. I'm just going to sort of live out the bounds of it. God says, broken without remedy. Or, look at this. Here's what you and I can do. We can break up the fallow ground of our heart. Think about it. You say, well, that'll require a little work. Yes. But guess who's working harder than you are at it? The Holy Spirit. He is at work helping us to do this, showing us how to do it, showing us what is necessary. Bertha Smith, if I'm not, I'm not mistaken, Bertha Smith has stood right here on this platform and spoken. Bertha Smith used to talk about making a sin list. Remember that? Get out of for, for me, the first time I did it, and I've done it several times, I had to use a legal pad, but write down every, call it what it is, every instance, every sin that you can recall. He said, after you get through the first 15 minutes, say, oh, that wasn't too bad. Just wait. The Holy Spirit has more to talk to you about, but make sure it's all there. Then confess it and destroy it, because if we confess it, He forgives us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And then seek this filling of the Holy Spirit. Let Christ fill our lives with His love. Let me tell you a story, then invitation time. We'll be out of here, celebrate the birthday of this wonderful church. Back at the turn of the last century, there was a, there, there was a man whom God chose to use in a very special way. And in the, in the late 40s and early 50s, God especially... Uh, moved in his life and in that part of the world which was the Hebrides Islands and the guy's name was Duncan Campbell Duncan Campbell came to know the Lord he was a, a, a bagpiper a sword dancer and he was at a dance and God he was actually he was playing on a bagpipe the green hills of Tyrol and uh, God reminded him of the hymn the green hills of Calvary and suddenly he fell under conviction of sin and he just gathered everything up. And right in the middle of just everybody thought he was crazy, he just left. 
And on his way home, he passed by a church, and the light was on the church. It was almost midnight. And he, and he went in, and his dad uh, was there praying for him. And so he went home, and he, he said to his dad there in the church, he said, he said, my sins are before me. And his dad said, go home and tell God. Well, he went home and told his mother. And she said, you go out the barn and tell God. And he fell on his knees. I, I, I wish I could tell you this story. It's an incredible story of how God used a man to bring revival to an end time, just swept through the Hebrides Islands. Well, you say, isn't that great? He came to a point in his life where Everybody said, you ought to be a preacher professionally. And he went to seminary, and he began to doubt the Bible, and he just died on the inside. How long did that go on? That went on for 17 years. He got married, had children, and he just, as a preacher, he'd stand up and preach all the truth, just dead, just dead. And one day, he woke up in the morning, and he heard his daughter, he had a 16-year-old daughter. She was singing, uh, Jeremy, they are coming, they are coming from far. She just recently surrendered to missions. And he got up and went down, and she was standing at the window, and she turned around and said to him, Daddy, isn't Jesus wonderful? And he said, you know, like a lot of us, hey, praise the Lord. Yeah, he's wonderful. He said, what makes him so wonderful to you? She said, oh, Daddy, I've just spent an hour with him. And he thought, how long has it been since I even spent 30 minutes with God. He had to go preach. So he went off and preached at a deeper life conference and came home that night and told his wife, hold the meal. Went up into a room, began to pray, fell on his knees and began to pray. He said, it was like the ceiling was frozen over me and my prayers just fell down. He said, twice, my little daughter came in, knelt beside me. Daddy, go through with God, she said. She said, Daddy, why is it not with you and God as it used to be? I hear you talk about the way it used to be. Why is it not with you and God as it used to be? And you know what he did? There on his knees during the night, he literally broke up the fallow ground of his heart. And the Lord God came to that cleansed heart, filled him with the Spirit, stepped forth, and you know what happened? The second great wave of revival began to sweep across the Hebrides. In, if I could tell you the story, I'm talking about entire communities coming to Christ in, in a flash like that. Just It was incredible. But God had to find somebody who's willing to break up the fallow ground of his heart. That's what I'm saying. And if you would say with me, I want to ask us to pray. Let's just, let's just pray. Father, I pray asking you to just speak to our hearts. Lord, I don't know where to start. I don't know how to put my hands on this issue. I know we need revival. I know that, Lord. We need revival, personal revival, corporate revival. God, this world needs a revived church. It needs us revived. Uh, what are heads about? Let me, let me just ask this question. How, how many people here right now, just as a, as a means of saying, okay, I'm going to come clean and admit what God already knows about me. How many people would say, you know, I've never been scripturally baptized. That is baptized by immersion since I came to know Christ as my Savior. Would you raise your hand? I'm always surprised the number of people who raise their hands. Yeah. I mean, I'm just going to trust you to tell one of the pastors here about that. But if you would say here today in this service, all kidding aside, not thinking about what it looks like to the church or to anybody else, in this auditorium today, there's one person, at least one, who needs to break up the fallow ground of his heart or her heart. And by the grace of God, beginning today, somehow, some way, I'm going to let God put 
the spade of his Holy Spirit deep into my heart and turn up everything in my life that's unholy and unrighteousness. I want to confess it, seek his cleansing because of his blood on the cross of Calvary. I can claim that if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. And into my cleansed life, I'm going to pray that Christ would begin to move in a new way. The Holy Spirit would fill my life. If you would say that I, this is the invitation, I'm going to ask you just to get up and come, whether you kneel or stand or you're in the aisle or whatever, we're not going to sing or anything, just do it right now. I mean, just stand up and make your way toward this altar. You're saying, I am willing, I am willing, I want to, begin, I want to break up the fallow ground of my heart. So come on right now, we'll just wait, we'll just wait. This is your invitation to say yes to God. My, so many standing, coming. God, I want to break up the fallow ground of my heart. That's what I want to do. And Lord, I know I have to do it. I can't just say, okay, God, I'm not going to participate in this. I'm just, I'm just who I am. And I, Lord, if you want to use me, just do that. No, no, God is saying, it's time, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and reigns righteousness on us. Are there others who join us now here at this altar? Any more before we pray together? And if you need to join this church or be, you say, well, <laughs> listen, I'd run to join this church. If you, if you could have heard our pastor, Gordon, all those years, pour out his heart, urging us to go to the ends of the earth. God has great plans, great, great desires for us. But it begins individually when we break up the fallow ground of our hearts. Father, you see us. Lord, this is, this is a start. We are, in essence, we are kneeling on the starting line of revival. And Lord, in our hearts, the gun is sounding. And we are saying that, that this day is not going to end. We're going to start this process of reaching up, taking you by the hand, and cooperating with your plan for revival, which begins with me admitting to you that I need you. I need your cleansing. I need your forgiveness. Here are the areas, not just the areas, here are the incidents when I have rebelled and said no to you or allowed the world to creep into my life or not done what I ought to do or done something I knew not to do. Lord, this is, this is my saying, I want to be used by you. And for that to happen, I must surrender absolutely to you. I know you will not brook any sin in my life. There's nothing that you say, oh, that's okay. Yeah, well, that's pretty good. Well, you're doing pretty good. You only got three out of four. Yeah. Lord, you want a clean vessel. And we're asking you to hold our feet to the fire. That's what we're, we're here at the starting line. And we don't know how you're going to carry this out this week and in the weeks to come, what it would mean to have revival personally, and it might even erupt corporately, God. Who knows? You may choose to just settle down among us corporately as you have so many times before. Lord, we pray with others, do that again. But we know our part is to break up the fallow ground of our hearts. Help us not to look around and try to break up somebody else's fallow ground. Help us, Lord, to look inward 
to let your Holy Spirit deal with us deeply and thoroughly and send us away from this altar, dear Lord, eagerly aware that there is work to be done. But there is a life to be lived that is so exciting, so fruitful, so meaningful if we will just say yes to you. So, Lord, we give you the keys now to our life. We ask you to hold our feet to the fire. And we pray these things, Jesus, in your wonderful and blessed and matchless name. Amen. God bless you as you're dismissed. And let's join together out there in the hallway for a wonderful celebration, not only of what we have said and what God's doing in our life, but what God's done in this church for 65 years. Join us out there.